Marxism and Freedom by Rhea Dunayevskaya, Chapter 13, Russian State Capitalism versus Workers' Revolt. The Russian Scene. In the background of the 1920-21 trade union debate hovered the question of planning. Despite Trotsky's later claim, it is not true that he had been the first to propose a single national economic plan. The necessity of a single national plan appeared in the new program, that is to say, the first program of the newly reorganized Communist Party following the successful 1917 revolution. However, it is true that the whole question of planning, with the exception of that for the critical electric industry, G-O-E-L-R-O, -E was unreal when the working class was the soldiery defending the country. Trotsky was the first to reintroduce the idea of the single national plan as something concrete. In his speech to the Ninth Congress of the Russian Communist Party, March 1920, he said, If we are seriously talking about planned economy, which is planned from the center with a single thought, then manpower is distributed in accordance with a national economic plan on a given stage of development, then the working mass cannot be wandering Russians. It must be moved about, appointed, commanded, exactly like soldiers. This conception permeated all of Trotsky's speeches during the entire trade union debate. It is this which Lenin continued to oppose to his dying day. On December 22, 1920, Trotsky addressed the 8th Congress of Soviets. In his speech, The Road to a Single Economic Plan, his administrative conception came out clearly enough in the formulation, it is necessary to guarantee the unity of leadership in all economic commissari commissariates. This administrative conception had been in Trotsky's propositions from the start, when he first introduced into the leadership the idea of both planning and free trade. When Lenin came around to the idea of a single national plan, he repeated his objection, but not administratively, not in uniting the commissariate, commissariates, rather in drawing in the broadest possible masses. Even during the Kronstadt mutiny and the introduction of the NEP, the resolution of the 10th Congress considers necessary the realization of the following organizational measures. One, participation of the trade unions in the working out of a single economic plan and production program, and equal participation in the practical leadership by the realization and execution of these programs. Two, the formation of economic organizations. The organization of management of industry is formed by agreement between the trade union and the corresponding economic organs on the basis of proposals of the trade unions. In a word, the two opposing conceptions of plan, which Marx in Capital had first analyzed as the despotic plan of, cap of capital and the plan of cooperative labor, were being fought out in the life rather than in theory. In the most unusual circumstances of a worker state with bureaucratic distortions, allowing private trade. After the death of Lenin, the development of the NEP proceeded according to its own dialectic. Begun as a limited measure to allow the worker state a brother, a breather, it ended in the usual growth of capital and the worsening of the conditions of the workers. Trotsky then introduced the question of plan, this time to curb private trade and give, give a greater role to the workers or at least the workers' state. Stalin's opposition was purely factional. He was b with Bukharin, who had, who had maintained that Russia could reach socialism at a snail's pace. But Trotsky was no sooner expelled than the plan with a capital P was introduced. Stalin became the planner extraordinary to the extent that Trotsky clung to the plan to that extent despite his constant criticisms of the tempo, he was in actuality a prisoner of Stalin's plan. In the process, the very concept of socialism was, was reduced to the concept of plan. 
At the same time, on a world scale, the 1929 crash brought forth a flood of plans from New Deal alphabetical agencies to Japan's co-prosperity sphere. The theoretical problem Marx had posed nearly a century ago of the centralization of capital into the hands of one capitalist or one capitalist corporation, the unemployed army and the breakdown of capitalism had become concrete and crucial. During the Long Depression, thousands of, of American intellectuals turned toward Marxism and Leninism. They met Stalinist communism, which spent an incredible amount of time, care, energy, and vigilance to confine Marx and Lenin within the bounds of its warped philosophy that private property equals capitalism and state property equals socialism. Because Trotsky's conception that workers' state equals state property was not fundamentally different from the Stalinist thesis, it could not become an independent polarizing force despite his continuous struggle against the Stalinist bureaucracy. The result was that Russia continued to parade as if it were something different from capitalism, as if state capitalism was the new society of socialism rather than the ultimate development of capitalism. Indeed, the analysis of the Russian five-year plans, and therefore of the law of motion of the Russian economy, originally made by this author to prove state capitalism in Russia, was disregarded by academic economists and Trotskyists alike. It is only with the Cold War since the end of World War II that the academic economists took a second look at Russia and the phrase, state capitalism has suddenly become almost a journalistic cliche. Economics, or economics, <laughs> however, is once again running a losing race against history, for by now it is not the economics of Marx, but is humanism which has assumed correctness, or concreteness. This is the crucial question which Russian communism must avoid, like the plague, a concrete study of the actual development of the plans and of the unplanned revolts against them will show why. A. The first five-year plan, relations between planners and workers, 1928 to 32. The first five-year plan was introduced in October 1928, shortly after Stalin emerged as the complete victor over all competing tendencies in the Russian Communist Party. The internal struggle had been unloosed with Lenin's death and ended for a time with the exile of Trotsky and the imprisonment of his left opposition. For a brief moment, the first few months of the plan, the Russian workers welcomed the end of the new economic policy and the beginning of what they thought would be socialist planning. They were indeed so enthusiastic that they overfulfilled all norms, quotas of production set by the state plan. The workers had gained the seven hour day workers' conflict commissions were still functioning and, in general, favored workers in their fight with management. On January 5, 1929, for example, Economic Life, organ of the Council of Labor and Defense, emphasized that piecework rates were subject to the approval of the Workers' Conflict Commission. The responsibility for fulfilling the financial program, on the other hand, rested exclusively with management. That issue of the publication also reported that it was an, was an ordinary occurrence for workers who were dismissed by management to be reinstated by the labor inspector. A new decree of January 24th made workers responsible for damaged goods. The state planners ordered the five-year plan to be completed in four. This speed up became the sharp point of division between planner and worker. The state planners called 1929 the year of decision and transformation. That was certainly fact. From then on, the execution of the state plan turned into an endless battle between the state planners and the workers. The two antagonist plans inherent in capitalistic production, that of the workers and that of the management hierarchy, came to the fore. The planners struck out against the workers' resistance to plan. They eliminated workers' production conferences with their conflict commissions. Instead, production conferences were instituted between engineers and managers presided between engineers and managers presided over by the politicians. 
At the same time, trials of professionals began. A number of state plan officials were charged with wrecking. This was the preview of that distinctive feature of state capitalism, confessions and recantations. It was lost upon the world because of the 1929 crash. The world crisis in turn adversely affected the price Russian wheat could command on the world market. Money was short for the purchase of tractors. This was crucial for the plan since tractors were not manufactured rapidly enough in Russia to take the place of draft animals. The peasants in their resistance to collectivization carried out such mass slaughter of animals that Russia has not recovered to this day. The vast extent of this slaughter of animals was revealed in Stalin's report to the 17th Congress of the Russian Com Communist Party in 1934. Millions of head? Huh? Um, so 1928, there were 33.9 million horses. In 1932, there was 19.6. Uh, large horned cattle, there was 70.5 million in 1928 and uh, 40.7 in 1932. Sheep and goats, 146.7 in 1928 and 52 in 1932. Pigs, there were 26 million in 1928 and 11.6 in 1932. There was such havoc on the countryside that the grain harvest declined from 83.5 million tons in 1930 to 70 million in 1931. The planners never admitted the terrible famine of 1932 to 33. They destroyed the census rather than reveal the number who perished. In this year of decision and transformation, the Russian workers grew increasingly restless. Beginning with 1930, the state hit back and instructed labor exchanges to put workers who leave jobs on their own initiative on a special list. That blacklist deprived the worker of unemployment compensation. By October 9th, unemployment was declared abolished. Unemployment compensation was stopped altogether. It became obligatory for factory directors to insert into the workers' paybook the reasons for his dismissal. But nothing could stop the labor turnover. By the end of the first five-year plan, the labor turnover had reached the staggering figure of 152%. Thereupon, Russia passed a new decree. To order that a worker be dismissed from the services of a factory establishment, even in the case of one day's absenteeism from work without sufficient reasons, and be deprived of the food and goods card issued to him as a member of the staff of the factory or establishment, and also of the use of the lodgings which were, followed, were allowed to him in the houses belonging to the factory or establishment. Planner and worker had reached opposite sides of the production perspective. As if stage directed, the Soviet theoretician politicians followed in the footsteps of classical political economy whose theory, Marx stated, was to accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets, accumulation for accumulation's sake, production for production's sake. By this formula, classical economy expressed the historical mission of the bourgeoisie and did not for a single instant deceive itself over the birth throes of wealth. Stalin did not deceive himself either. He was more ruthless because we live in the age of state capitalism. While the basic problem everywhere in the world now is labor productivity, how to get workers to work more, nowhere is it more urgent than in a, in a totalitarian state. That is why it is totalitarian. 1. The Turnover Tax there is a parallel between the functioning of a totalitarian state and the origins of private capitalism. In tracing the history of primitive accumulation, Marx concluded that the only part of the so-called national wealth that actually enters into the collective possessions of modern peoples is their national debt. Never was this more true than in Russia, where the whole cost of industrialization and militarization has been borne by the people through that ingenious scheme known as the turnover tax. The manner of raising the state treasury to pay for the plan appeared in an innocent enough guise. On December 5, 1929, the Central Committee of the Russian Communist Party passed the following resolution. 
to instruct the people's commissar commiss commissariat of finance and Supreme Council of National Economy to draw up a system of taxation and government on the principle of a single tax on profits. The single tax on profits turned out to have two sections. One, a tax on profits which comprised 9 to 12% of the state budget, and two, a turnover tax which comprised 60 to 80% of the budget, added to the compulsory deliveries by the collective farms. The turnover tax suffices to finance all industrialization and militarization. The turnover tax is unevenly applied. It is lightest on heavy industry and heaviest on bread and agricultural produce. Contrary to the usual sales tax, which is a fixed percentage of the base price of the commodity, the turnover tax is a fixed percentage of the total sales value of merchandise, including the amount of tax. In plain language, this means that whereas a 90% sales tax raises the price of merchandise 90%, a 90% turnover tax increases the sales price tenfold. Take bread, which is the staff of life for a Russian worker. In paying a ruble for his kilo of black bread, he pays 25 kopecks for the actual cost of the bread, including production, distribution, and delivery. The remaining 75 kopecks of that ruble go to the state as turnover tax. Prices skyrocketed so that the worker was faced with actual starvation. Rationing had to be introduced to assure the manual laborers of getting at least enough food. The dividing line between planners and workers was reaching the breaking point. Stalin, as usual, didn't flinch from his headlong march to capitalistic relations. Far from halting or even slowing down the unbearable tempo of industrialization, the slogan was first, the, or the five-year plan in four. Stalin called for the creation of a new industrial and technical intelligentsia. He was very specific and tirelessly repetitious as to what the new conditions, new tasks were. One, it was necessary to end depersonalization by displaying the maximum care for the specialists, engineers, and technicians. Two, it was necessary to be done with the foolishness of, e of equalitarianism, better pay for better work. Three, it was necessary to stop the instability of labor in industry. A greater differentiation must be made between skilled and unskilled. Wages must be organized in a new way. Four, business accounting must be introduced in order that an increase in accumulation and a lowering of production costs be achieved. Such continued Stalin in his address to the Conference of Industrial Managers on June 23, 1931, are the new conditions of the development of industry, demanding new methods of work and new methods of leadership in our economic construction. Although this was being done with great deliberation and consciousness, let no one assign omniscience to Stalin. There is no doubt that he was making a conscious effort to create leaders, managers, organizers, in a word, bosses. However, it took another four years before an aristocracy of labor could be created. His iron will was the manifestation of the objective drive of the industrial development. The first five-year plan ended with, one, actual famine conditions on the countryside, where Stalin was busy liquidating the Kulak as a class, two, a 152% labor turnover in cities, and three, the beginnings of a new class called the Industrial and Technical Intelligentsia. The country had certainly achieved a rapid degree of industrialization, although we can dismiss the fantastic claims of accomplishments. More unplanned for events occurred than those which were planned, the one thing that was certain beyond the para, peradventure of a doubt was the direction in which the economy was developing. There was a continuous preponderance of means of production over means of consumption. What Marx had shown as the principle of capitalist development turned out to be the exact direction of Russian economic development. The planners proudly paraded the relationship achieved between the two major departments of production. Um, 
So means of production in 1928 was 44.3, and then in 1932 it was 52.3. Means of consumption in 1928 was 55.7, and then 46.7 in uh, 1932. On the horizon now appeared the social physiognomy sig- sig- <laughs> of the new ruling class, which in 1930, Christian Rakowski, a leader of the left opposition, characterized as follows. A ruling class other than the proletariat is crystallizing before our very eyes. The motive force of this singular class is the singular form of private property, state power. Its specific contribution to capitalist production in general is forced labor. Forced labor camps appeared at the outset of the second five-year plan. B. The second five-year plan. The one-party state takes full totalitarian form and completes the counter-revolution. 1 forced labor camps. Thus far, the movement of the Russian economy was along the traditional direction of any capitalism. What greets us, however, in the second five-year plan is new. That frightful companion of state capitalism, forced labor camps, made its first appearance in a modern industrial society in 1933. In June of that year, the Commissariat of Labor was abolished, and the trade unions were incorporated as part of the state machinery. Five weeks later, on August 1st, 1933, under the euphemistic title of the Labor Corrective Code, we find listed as places of detention, corrective colonies, factory colonies, agricultural colonies, colonies of mass work and penalty penalty colonies. The purpose? Factory colonies are organized for the purpose of inculcating labor habits. By July 10th, 1934, the Commissariat of Internal Affairs, NKVD, was created to take the place of the OGPU, Secret Police. It was given the additional duty of forming a Department of Correctional and Labor Camps and Labor Settlements. On October 27, 1934, this was supplemented by a resolution of the Central Executive Committee and Council of People's Commissars as follows. All correction institutions, prisons, isolators, Correct, correction colonies and the bureaus of correction work without deprivation of freedom, which are, are, which are at present managed by the People's Commissariat of Justice of each constituent republic, are to be transferred to the competence of the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs and its, lo- and its local organs. The Commissariat of Justice is nothing but a tool of the GPU which had been transformed into the NKVD, so that from now on, party purges, arrests, exile, as well as inculcating labor habits are all coordinated. The image of the one-party state ruling class now loomed inside every factory in Hamlet and school. Not even minors were spared. The death penalty was introduced for minors from 12 years of age. Jeez. 12, or 2. Stakhanovite Speed Demons. The first year of the second five-year plan had begun, on April 28, 1933, with the ordering of a party purge. The purge lasted no less than two years and completely transformed what was left of the Bolshevik party. The trade unions, as we saw, had already been abolished. They were blamed for the resistance of the workers to the norms set by the plan. The terrible famine on the countryside drove millions of peasants to the city, creating a considerable army of surplus labor. In an effort to halt this disrupting flow of peasants into the city, the planners introduced the system of internal passports. At the same time, they looked to this army of surplus labor to offset the low productivity in the factories. On March 16, 1933, Industry, the organ of the Commissariat of Heavy Industry, advised managers that they now have a trump card There are more workers in the shops than is necessary according to plans. The advice wasn't lost. The struggle between management and workers intensified. Stalin's slogan of 1931, end depersonalization or better pay for better work, had lain dormant because it could not gain momentum until a piecework system was introduced. Marx had declared the piecework system to be best suited for the capitalist mode of production. In 1935, Stalin hailed such a system as a gift from heaven. 
V. Meslock, then chairman of the State Planning Commission, thus explained the gift from heaven. A plain miner, the Donitz Basin Hewer, Alexei Stekhanov, in response to Stalin's speech of May 4, 1935, the keynote of which was the care of the human being and which marked a new stage of development of the USSR, produced a new system of labor organization for the extraction of coal. The very first day his method was applied, he cut 102 tons of coal in one shift of six hours, instead of the established rate of seven tons. In the four months that elapsed between Stalin's speech of May 4th and Stukhanov's achievement of August 31st, the state did not miss a single publicity trick in setting up this miracle. The press, photographers, the wires of the world all immediately heard of the gift from heaven. What they did not hear about were the hothouse conditions that were created to enable Stekhanov's to become, or Stekhanov to become a speed demon. One, he and subsequent Stekhanovites received the finest tools and ruined them at the fastest pace without having to pay for them. The average production worker, on the other hand, must pay for all goods he damages. Two, a brigade of helpers do all the detail work. They get no extra money. Three, above everything, those record breakers for a day do not repeat their records. They retire to swivel chairs. The mass of workers are now told that the miracle must be the norm. Armed with stakonivism, the state was able to revive the 1931 slogan and depersonalization, or train the recalcitrant factory hands. As the capitalist philosopher Ehr expressed it more honestly in the day of the Industrial Revolution, piecework was made the prevailing system of work. In the early worker state, the pay differential from the lowest paid worker to the highest ranged from one to three. With stakonivism, the range became one to 20. Ending depersonalization and creating this extreme differentiation in pay would however mean nothing if rationing was still in effect and the Stakhanovites could buy nothing with their money. Thereupon rationing was ended and the production of luxury goods extended. So watches in 1932, 65,000 had been produced. In 1936, it was 558,000. Gramophones in 1932 was 58,000. In 1936, 337,000. Cameras in 1932 was 30,000. And in 1936, it was 557,000. Silk um, was 21.5 million meters in 1932. And in 1936, it was 51,220 million meters. That's a big difference. The average worker continued to eat black bread and have his kipya talk hot water. Given this base and with the given aim, it was impossible simultaneously to extend production of consumption. Wait, oh fuck no. To extend production of the means of production as well as production of the means of consumption. One or the other had to be sacrificed. It was so under competitive market capitalism. It proved to be so under autarkic, statified production. The constant necessity to expand in order to catch up with and outdistance the capitalist lands, the high organic composition of capital in the advanced capitalist world, which imposed the same technical composition upon the Russian economy. All these demanded sacrifice in the sphere of producing articles for mass consumption. Distribution of articles for mass consumption had to be brought into conformity with the reality of the stage of production. It was not a question, as Trotsky thought, of bourgeois norms of distribution. It was a matter of the bourgeois method of production. In his preface to Capital, Marx explained that he did not paint the capitalist and landlord in Couleur de Rose not because as individuals they were necessarily evil, but here individuals are dealt with only insofar as they are the personifications of economic categories, embodiments of particular class relations or relationships and class interests. Three, Stalin's constitution on the classless intelligentsia. 
The mid-30s saw the emergence of a new type of Soviet man, the type of executive administrator familiar enough in the Western world as the man in the gray flannel suit. He made clear by his everyday behavior how different he was from the workers. As if giving bodily form to what Marx called the strictly regulating authority of the social mechanism of the labor process graduated into a complete hierarchy, this gentleman of the intelligentsia acted the part as if it were made for him. In this hierarchic structure of the labor process, the intelligentsia served the plan. The norms are to be fulfilled by others, the great mass of the population. The compelling needs of capitalist value production made them of the mold of all rulers. They bear as little resemblance to the men and women who led the revolution as Napoleon bore to the San or the Sans Culotte. The Russian workers know that the job of factory director is not, as the planners put it, merely functional. The extreme income differentials of 1 to 20 are a starter. The mass base of the present regime is wider than, the un than that under the SARS. But the top echelons constitute, as we shall see in a moment, a bare 2.05% of the total population. In 1937, Molotov boasted that there were 1,751,000 leading positions in the Soviet Union and 250,000 engineers and architects without personal responsibility for enterprises or projects. By 1939, Molotov achieved a precision that can come only from extreme class, ruling class, consciousness. The specificity in enumerating the hierarchy of skills and responsibility is a reflection of the class structures as enshrined in the constitution of the land, which differentiates between workers and peasants on the one hand and the intelligentsia on the other hand. Um, so I'm going to read these, I don't know, tables, and hopefully it makes sense. Aristocracy of labor, uh, so these numbers are in the thousands. Heads of tractor brigade, brigades, 97.6 thousand. Heads of field brigade, brigades, 549.6 thousand. Heads of livestock brigades, 103.1 thousand. Tractor drivers, 803.1 thousand um, combined operators. Okay, so tractor drivers and operators is 803.1 thousand. Skilled laborers in industry, five, 537.4 thousand. Um, and that includes metal workers, lathe operators, welders, and molders. Uh, so the total there would be 6,927.8 thousand. The next table is for employees. This again is in the thousands. Economists and statisticians is 822,000. Legal personnel, so judges and attorneys, 46,000. Engineers and architects, excluding those acting as directors, 250,000. Doctors and middle medical personnel, 762,000. Middle technical personnel, 836,000. Agro-technical personnel, uh, 96,000. Teachers, 1,207,000. 1, so that would be 1 million. 207,000. Cultural and technical workers, so journalists, librarians, club directors, and the like, 495,000. Art workers, 46,000. And bookkeepers, accountants, and etc., 1,769,000. So the total of employees is 6,329,000. The next table is for the advanced intelligentsia again in the thousands. Factory directors and managers, Kolkots, Sovkots, and MTS presidents, 1,751,000. Agronomists, 80,000. Scientific workers, including supervisors and professors, 93,000. 
and others, which would include army intelligentsia and other. 1,550,000. So the total for the advanced intelligentsia would be 3,474,000. We see revealed here that approximately 16.7 million, or less than 10% of the total population, are considered to be the classless intelligentsia. In the broadest sense of the word, the most advanced of the intelligentsia. I'll see if that makes sense. The most advanced of the intelligentsia, the genuine creators of a new life, as Molotov called them, those who are the real bosses over the economy, constitute a mere 3.4 million or 2.005% of the total population. The remaining 8% share in the surplus value and sing the praises of the rulers, to whom they leave the running of the economy and the state, setting policy and making plans. Even without marking this advanced section, exploiters, the social physiognomy of the ruling class is clear enough. The classless intelligentsia had now to be given legitimacy. In 1936, the Stalin Constitution did just that. It is in direct opposition to the early constitution which bore witness to the transitional character of the dictatorship of the proletariat in the following words. The principal object of the constitution of the RSFSR, which is adapted to the present transition period, consists in the establishment of the dictatorship of the urban and rural proletariat and the poorest peasantry in the form of the strong all-Russian power with the aim of securing the complete suppression of the bourgeoisie, the abolition of exploitation of man by man, and the establishment of socialism, under which there shall be neither class division nor state authority. The new Stalin constitution, on the other hand, while claiming that socialism was irrevocably established, nevertheless strengthened the state authority in the form of complete totalitarianism. It established piecework as the reigning system, from each according to his abilities to each according to his work. It decreed the protection of state property and personal property from thieves and misappropriators. Far from the withering away of the state, this octopus will first gorge itself on what is left of the revolution and on the workers who dare to resist. The Moscow trials will liquidate, literally liquidate, the general staff who led the revolution. The ruling bureaucracy let loose with a series of macabre trials, the like of which had not been seen since the Spanish Inquisition and the hunt for witches. These trials had all the added terrorism, violence, and shamelessness that only a totalitarian state can produce. First was the Zinoviev Kamenev trial, then the Radak Pietikov and Bukharin Rikov trials. Then the trial on camera of the military staff headed by Tukhakevsky, and finally the trial of the Yagodas, who staged the first set of trials. The fantastic confessions and debasement of the general staff of the revolution, who had long since capitulated and recapitulated and been isolated and imprisoned with, without stature or dignity added up to the extermination of the memory of revolution in some men and helped complete the rewriting of history. But it was not for history that all this was staged. The full totalitarian state had taken shape. It was throwing its weight around. It needed that bloodletting in order to install firmly the new class created by the new method of production. Nor was the greatest frame up in history limited to the men who led the revolution. Quite the contrary, its full fury was unloosed against the workers. The mass graves discovered at the end of the war bear terrifying witness to that. The millions who filled and fill the concentration camps show that the Moscow trials did not change the workers' attitudes to the totalitarian state. The Moscow trials were the culmination of the counter-revolution that we saw developing early in the changed relations of production. A hangman's noose rather than a full army sufficed because only one of the parties to this conflict was armed. 
Whatever had been left of the October Revolution was exterminated, and the proletarian state overthrown not so much by the ex execution of the old Bolsheviks, although that is always a manifestation of counter-revolution, but by clearing a place in the process of production for the new class. That place could have been cleared for the classless intelligentsia only where such a full-blown class had already come into existence, only where the method of production itself called it forth. The production relations established by the revolution had long become incompatible with this new method of production. That is why the bloodbath came at the end of the second five-year plan. The Russian worker knows that the production relations of state property demand his sweat and degradation. That state bears as much resemblance to a worker state as the president of the United States Steel Corporation does to a steel worker, just because they are both employees of the same corporation. The counter-revolution of 1935-37 to 37 was the culmination of what began with the introduction of the plan. The plan brought worker and manager into immediate conflict. The liquidation of the trade unions into the state apparatus symbolized the unbridgeable gulf between planner and worker. Stakhanovites, engineers, and administrators in production, and officers in the army joined those in the state to form the bulwark of the new ruling class, which was given juridical status, that is, legitimacy, in the Soviet Constitution of 1956. The experience of Russia since 1936 has exploded the idea that planning by any other class than the proletariat can ever reverse the law of motion of capitalist society. C. The third five-year plan and a summation of all the plans at the outbreak of war. Russia has achieved great industrial growth. The claims made by the Russians, however, are very questionable. The agricultural collapse in 1932, e.g. is listed as the plan 93.7% fulfilled. Since it did not figure as part of the plan, the planners simply ignored the drastic slaughter of livestock. Greater than the de decrease between 1914 and 1920, due to the war, revolution, civil war, and famine. Since there were always more unplanned things occurring than planned ones, the planners simply took the average of a basic industry, which had overshot its mark, 103%, plus an uncompleted house which could not be lived in at all. It was thus easy for them to declare all sorts of accomplishments. 2 plus 2 equals anything they want it to equal. Prior to World War II, however, criticism of the Russian method of measuring industrial growth was not widely believed because Russia alone seemed to be growing, while the rest of the world was unable to get out of the throes of the Long Depression. The Russian economists referred to the, purposed, or the purported 650% achievements of Soviet industrialization, but an index of total industrial production, which carefully weighs awaits each element in the economy in order to arrive at a statistically valid index of the volume of production has never been, been prepared by the Russian economists. This task, never easy under ordinary circumstances, is especially difficult in the case of Soviet statistics, which are concealed or perverted to prove the correctness of the general line. Under these circumstances, the best available gauge is to compare physical output of selected sections of both heavy and light industry, as well as agricultural production, against a background of statistics on population and national income. Below is an abstract of the USSR, prepared by this author, to illustrate the course of development for the whole economy from Tsarist times through 1940. Figures for the year 1922 have been included in order to show the accelerated place or pace of the growth of production from the year of ruin following the end of counter-revolution and famine to the eve of the first world, the first five-year plan. All data are from official state documents in the original Russian, 1913, 1922, and 1928 figures from Gosplan, State Planning Commission for the Development of the National Economy of the USSR, 
the five-year plan, 1932 and 1937 figures from Gosplin, um, 1940 figures from reports to the 18th, 18th Conference of the Russian Communist Party appearing in Pravda, February 18th to 21st, 1941. So there's a big full-page chart here, and I am not reading that. The value of gross industrial production in billions of rubles, fixed 1926 to 27 prices, reveals the following proportional development of the means of production to the means of consumption since the initiation of the first five-year plan. Uh, I'm not reading that. It's too much. It's, it's another chart. The statistical measurement of the Russian economy is presented here not in order to enter the field of dispute, as to the phenomenal or non-phenomenal development of Russian industri industrialization, nor as important as they may be is the author interested in the correct weighting of the official figures. The fundamental purpose of this table of Russian industrialization, rather, was to show the direction in which the Russian economy moved during the years of, of the plans before World War II wrought its devastation. It is clear from this that the direction of its growth the preponderance of means of production over means of consumption, the high organic composition of capital, and the rapid deterioration of the living standards of the masses is neither merely accidental nor due to war conditions, but was the inevitable consequence of the law of motion of that economy, which, like any other capitalist economy, rests on paying the worker at minimum and extracting from him the maximum. From the statistical table, it was seen that this author's estimate of the real weekly wages of the average Russian worker in 1940 was only 62.4% that of 1913. This, coin, this point can be made more graphic by showing what food, which takes most of his pay, costs a Russian worker. An official 1926 study provided the information as to the foods on average Moscow worker could an average Moscow worker consumed. The publication of the food index in Russia was stopped in 1930. However, with the abolition of rationing, the prices of the main commodities were published. Further data in regard to the rise in retail prices in government stores in Moscow, 1939 and 1940, were gathered by the American Embassy and published in the November 1939 and May and August 1940 issues of the Monthly Labor Review. From the food prices against wages, a true picture of the conditions of the Russian workers will emerge. There's another complex table here that you might want to have a look at. Uh, using 1913 as 100, the index of the cost of food for 1928 is 187 and for 1940 is 2,248. The weekly wages for those years were 1913, 6 rubles, 1928, 14 rub rubles, and 1940, 83 rubles. Again, using 1913 as our base year for nominal weekly wages, we have an index for 1928 of 233 and for 1940 of 1,383. We can now construct our index of real wages by dividing the nominal weekly wage into the real cost of food, thus obtaining 125 as the index of real wages in 1928 and 62.4% for 1940, when compared to Tsarist times. Had we considered the further rise in food prices by October 1940, it would have been a mere 55% of 1913, and even that appallingly low figure, which so glaringly proves the, de the deterioration in the workers' standard of living, does not picture the situation at its worst, for we have considered the single uniform price in 1940 and not the open market price, to which the workers sometimes had to resort because few foods were available in state stores. On the average, the open market prices were 78% higher than the state store prices. There is supposed to be no black market in Russia, but in the officially recognized free market Beef steaks sold for 17 rubles a kilo when the state stores sold the same commodity at 10 and a half rubles. At the same time, industrial development has not brought Russia out of its backwardness, 
when judged by per capita production. Um, there's more figures that are too complicated for me to really go over. In presenting the third five-year plan, therefore, Molotov made per capita production the key word. People here and there forgot that economically, that is from the point of view of the volume of industrial output per capita of the population. We are still behind some capitalist countries. Socialism has been built in the USSR, but only in the main. We have still a very great deal to do before the USSR is properly supplied with all that is necessary. Before we raise our country economically as well as technically to the level not only as high as that of the foremost capitalist countries, but considerably higher. The slogan of the first five-year plan to catch up with and outdistance the capitalist lands held for the second plan and remained for the third plan. Again, the unpardonable sin was the Russian workers' attitude to work under the plan. Molotov knows better than anyone that to accomplish what they did in the first plan, they were forced to use 22.8 million workers, whereas the plan called only for 15.7 million. He knows that the low labor productivity of the Russian worker is not a sign of his backwardness, but a sign of his continuous revolt against the conditions of production. 1. Crises and Purges The fundamental error of those who assume that a single capitalist society is not governed by the same laws as a society composed of individual private property-owning capitalists lies in a failure to realize that what happens in the market is not the cause but the consequence of the inherent contradiction of the process of production. A single capitalist society does not have an unlimited market. The market for consumption goods, as we have shown, is strictly limited to the luxuries of the rulers and the necessaries of the workers when paid at value. You're smelling. The slogan to catch up with and outdistance capitalist lands was the reflection of the compelling motive of the present world economy, who will rule over the world market. Therein lies the secret of the growth of the means of production at the expense of the means of consumption. Therein lies the cause for the living standards of the masses growing worse despite the state's desire for what it called the still better improvement of the conditions of the working class. Our specific single capitalist society has achieved some highly modern factories, a showy subway, and as Khrushchev assures us, an H-bomb big enough so that if we, he dropped it over the polar ice caps, it would flood the world. But it has not stopped to raise the living standards of the masses of Russian workers. It cannot. Capital will not allow it. Because of this, the economy is in constant crisis. The value of capital in the surrounding world is constantly depreciating, which means that the value of capital inside the capitalist country is constantly depreciating. It may not depreciate fully on the bureaucrats' books. However, since the real value of the product can be no greater than the value of the corresponding plant on the world market, the moment the Ford tractor was put alongside the Stalingrad tractor, the state had to reduce the price of its own brand. This was the case in 1931 when Russia when Russia, while importing 90% of the world's production of tractors, sold its own below cost. Of greater importance, and therein lies the essence of Marx's analysis of all economic categories as social categories, is the fact that no matter what figures may appear on the books, the means of production in the process of production reveal their true value in their relationship to the worker. That is to say, if an obsolescent machine was not destroyed but continued to be used in production, the worker suffers the more since the manager of production still expects him to produce articles at the socially necessary labor time set by the time clock of the world market. As long as planning is governed by the necessity to pay the laborer the minimum necessary for his existence and to extract from him the maximum surplus value, in order to maintain the productive system as far as possible within the lawless laws of the world market governed by the law of value, that is how long capitalist relations of production exist, no matter what you name the social order. 
It has thus been absolutely impossible for Stalin, as for his heirs, to guide the productive system without sudden stagnation and crises due to the constant necessity of adjusting the individual components of total capital to one another and to the world market. They have avoided the ordinary type of commercial crises, but on the other hand, when the crises came, they were more violent and destructive. Such was the case in 1932 and again in 1937. In 1932, it took the form of complete chaos in the countryside. In 1937, it took the form of the spectacular Moscow trials and the on-camera military trials. In both cases, industrial production as planned was as far apart from industrial production as accomplished, as heaven is from earth. Purges are not due to a state of mind, but to a state of production. They have never ceased in Russia and will never cease under the, that regime, because the crises never cease. The crises never cease because the revolt of the working class is continuous. 2. Labor before the law. The party bureaucracy armed with full state power began to wreak their vengeance in a new set of anti-labor labor legislation, the most oppressive ever recorded in the history of modern times. The 1940 laws forbid a worker to leave his job. Any inf infraction of factory discipline, such as coming 15 minutes late, is made punishable by six months at corrective labor that is, labor in the factory at 25% reduction in pay. If this law is violated, the worker is sent to forced labor camps. From the workers, the totalitarian bureaucracy moved over to take their vengeance on the youth. Teenagers were taken out of school and given six months to two years free vocational training, at the end of which they were to work where the state directed for two and up to four years, for two and up to two, Fuck, for two and up to four hours at the prevailing rate of pay. On December 26, 1940, Pravda reported that, particularly in the coal mines, truancies were greater in the first six months of the operation of the law than in the previous period. At the 1941 party conference held just a few months before the Nazi attack and after the European war had already been going on for nearly two years, the report stated that workers were constantly absenting themselves, particularly after payday, and that fully a third did not accomplish their norms. This draconian anti-labor legislation records the terror of the ruling bureaucracy in the face of the revolt of the workers. The revolt had begun soon after the inauguration of the first five-year plan. The workers performed miracles of ingenuity and endurance in resisting the totalitarian stranglehold over production. The peasants do the same on the countryside. The millions in forced labor camps are the true measure of the never-ending resistance of the Russian masses to the Russian rulers in the state, in the factory, and in the fields. Had the revolt not been so persistent, the terror would not have been so violent. D. The War and the Assault on Marx's Capital in 1939, Hitler, with his own three-year plan, his own end to, the un end to unemployment, his gas chambers and concentration camps, was poised, ready to centralize all of European capital. He got the go sign from Stalin and, with the Nazi-Soviet pact, launched the war against Poland, which the two dictators carved up between themselves. By 1941, the, dicta the dictators fell out. Stalin's full imperialist ambitions were not to be met until he joined with the Allies and got what he couldn't get from Hitler, Eastern Europe. In June 1941, Nazi Germany launched its attack against Russia. So deep are the antagonisms within Russia that Hitler marched up to Stalingrad before the Russian people chose to, 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 to turn the invaders back rather than suffer the added torment of foreign rule. But the Russian planners did not change, nor did they stop at taking away the workers' seven-hour day and making eight hours the regular working day with obligatory overtime. In fact, the slogan was, no distinction between the front and the rear. The insatiable hunger for production and more production lost all bounds right in the midst of war when the bureaucracy discovered the conveyor belt system. 
The year 1943 is officially referred to as the year of the conveyor belt or the, the year of the conveyor belt system. The assembly line technique was used to transform the individual breakneck comp competition of stakhanovism stac <laughs> into, I don't know how to pronounce it, into socialist emulation, that is factory to factory competition. No Russian worker could see the difference between his socialist labor and that which was described by Marx as capitalistic, alienated labor. The questions asked by students were likewise unanswerable. Hence, the teaching of political economy was stopped altogether. In the year that they discovered the conveyor belt system, the totalitarian theoreticians were emboldened to lay their brutal hands on Marx's capital. They ordered that the dialectical structure of capital no longer be followed. They now said that the law of value functions in the land of socialism. Heretofore, everyone, friend and foe, Marxist and non-Marxist alike, had agreed that Marx's law of value was the characteristic mark of the capitalist society. For that very reason, Russian theoreticians, until the publication of this 1943 article, claimed that the law of value did not operate in their country, which they declared to be the land of socialism. Now they found themselves in the dilemma of refusing to depart from the claim that Russia is socialist, yet at the same time suddenly admitting that the law of value does operate in Russia. For a Marxist, that would be an impossible situation. For a Russian communist, however, it was a blessing for Russian theory was thus finally squared with Russian reality. As I wrote in my com commentary then, the ideas and methodology of the article are not accidental. They are the methodology of an intelligentsia concerned with the acquisition of surplus products. What is important is that this departure from past teaching of political economy actually mirrors economic reality. The Soviet Union has entered the period of applied economics. Instead of theory, the article presents an administrative formula for minimum costs and maximum production. It is the constitution of Russia's post-war economy. It is true that the theoreticians thought they would solve their main problem of explaining away the functioning of the capitalistic law of value. However, the theoretical change of front is the least important aspect of the startling reversal in theory. Take, for example, the proposal that henceforth the teaching of capital should not begin with chapter 1, which includes the famous section on the fetishism of commodities. The fetishism of commodities is the mystery with which the social relations of production are clothed in bourgeois society. In Russia, where society is completely state, completely state capitalist, the bourgeois fetishism of commodities seems to be overcome. In a sense, it is. The Russian bureaucrats are not affected by problems of the market, nor confused by ideas of equal exchange, as are the bourgeois economists. But another aspect of fetishism, the critical one that Marx uncovered, was the perversity of relations between machine and man, where dead labor dominates over living labor. That is why Marx is so insistent in saying that the form of the commodity is fantastic, not because it is not true, but because it correctly reflects the real relations at the point of production. This fetishism not only has not been overcome in Russia, the plan has perfected it and become a prisoner of it. They have substituted for fetishism of commodities the fetishism of the plan, but their plan turns out to be no more than a disguise for the actual relations of production in the factory. They are no more able to overcome this fetishism than are the bourgeois economists. In other words, far from the plan bringing light into the relations of production in the factory, the state planners express in the plan the total domination of the workers by the machine. In reality, therefore, the state plan is nothing but the organization of the proletariat to produce under the domination of the machine. The need to square theory with reality meant one thing for the theoreticians and something else for the Russian workers. The former searched for the proper quotations. The latter knew that nothing at all could be changed for them with the end of the war. The teaching of capital would undergo 
would undergo the change. They would have to continue to produce more and more. At the same time, the theoretical revision served notice to the Allies that Russia was in the market for world domination. The theoretic foundation for the Cold War was laid. Never before has so gigantic a state mobilized itself with such murderous vigilance to keep the proletariat at work while the leaders plan. The Russian totalitarian bureaucracy is the most deadly, the most insidious, the most dangerous enemy because it springs from the proletariat and cloaks itself in Marxist terminology.